introduce Jane Caro to you. Um, Jane is a renowned author, novelist, lecturer, mentor, social commentator, columnist, board director, workshop facilitator, speaker, broadcaster and award-winning advertising writer, exhausted, and tweeter, and tweeter, I was watching the uh, act of tweeting there. And the common thread running through her career is a delight in words and a talent for using them to connect with other people. Today, she runs her own communications consultancy and lectures in advertising creative at the School of Communication Arts at UWS. She has written five books, The Stupid Country, How Australia is Dismantling Public Education, and The F Word, How We Learn, How we learn to Swear by Feminism, co-authored with Catherine Fox, What Makes a Good School, and For God's Sake. She edited the anthology Destroying the Joint. Her first novel, Just a Girl, was published in 2011. How exciting. Jane, I'd like to welcome you here today and, and uh, I'd like everybody to share in that. And Jane will be talking about you can't change the world by being nice. Thank you very much for inviting me. How wonderful childcare. Once upon a time I was desperate for it. <laughs> oh, but they're grown up now. Thank God it'll be their problem soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even nice as a mother. Um, <laughs> the older I get, the grumpier I get, I can tell you. Do you know Do you know what I had to do this morning? This is why I've got all this slap on. Look at me. I don't look like this normally. Um, I'm a media tart and I'm doing this thing on Channel 9 mornings called the water cooler. Uh, where we discuss various controversial topics and this morning was my first one and the topic, I kid you not, was some idiot psychologist, a woman, uh, how depressing, um, has done a survey where she now claims that women are hardwired, yes, it's in our genes, to be mean and nasty to one another. <laughs> I thought to myself, how ironic. What am I doing after I'm having this ridiculous discussion on um, television? I'm coming along to celebrate 35 years of Community Child Care Cooperative. Women who have looked after the very young and uh, the very vulnerable for, let's be frank, three fifths of fuck all, by the way. That's <laughs> funny. Um, <laughs> lower the time early in the morning. <laughs> um, and you know, yeah, apparently, ladies, it's us who are the mean ones. I've never got this. Um, the example I used of how ridiculous that is, actually, um, this morning, was, here's another, you know, you're on Twitter long enough, you nearly want to kill yourself. Um, somebody tweeted an article, uh, the, the, the women of Saudi Arabia, living in the 12th century, most of them poor things, um, want the right to drive. And a Saudi Arabian cleric's come out and told them that, you know, they can't possibly drive because if they do, they sit in such a funny way that it tilts their uterus and damages their ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what century you're in, 
some bloke somewhere will come up with the fact that what you want to do as a female isn't any good because it'll damage your goddamn uterus. <laughs> what I used to like was when I um, started out in the advertising business and it was kind of hard for women to get in um, because you got in, in Australia anyway, via dispatch, which meant in those days you had to carry big parcels. And of course, union said women couldn't carry very heavy parcels because it would damage our uteruses. <laughs> I used to think it was kind of funny, particularly after I had children and your childcare workers, you'll know about this very well, when I was dealing with a squirming, screaming, tantrum throwing, extremely heavy four-year-old on my hip, how come I could lift them and my uterus miraculously would survive this terrible pounding? Whereas when I was lifting a parcel of the same way, which after all was a parcel, it didn't swerve, it didn't try to hit me, um, and it didn't excrete nasty substances from various orifices in its fury. Um, how this was more dangerous to me than a screaming child, I never quite understood. But then, I'm only a woman. I'm not expected to understand. <laughs> So yes, I did point out that there are a number of countries in the world which restrict women's right still to vote. There are two left. One is the Vatican City, in case you're interested. People are always telling me how feminist the Catholics are. Um, particularly my friends who send their children to Catholic girls' schools, which I've never got. Um, okay, so there's, the, the, there's two countries in the world that don't allow women to vote. There are an awful lot that won't let them drive, won't let them leave the house without their husband's permission, work, control their own money, you know, you name it, the list goes on. But apparently, we're the mean ones. I don't know of a country in the world where women restrict men from doing any of those things. Do you? Can you name one? Has there ever been one? But we are hardwired to be nasty. <sighs> However, having said all that, I would like now to encourage you, well, you know, if they're going to call us nasty, heinous bitches, let's be them. <laughs> let's do it. Let's just go out there and be as nasty and obstructionist and as difficult and as outspoken and as rude and as foul-mouthed and as bad as we can possibly be. Can I tell you? We're going to have to wear the light for him, that's one. And you'll have a lot more fun. I have a sister-in-law, she's a lovely woman, she's a very, very good woman. Yes, and she's ended up as all good women do. Poor as a church mouse, eking out an existence in a very low paid job. That has been my experience with all my contemporaries <coughs> who resisted feminism at the time and said, no, you know, they really wanted to find a lovely man, hmm. um, marry them, and stay at home and mind their children and bring them up to be lovely people. Now, it's a perfectly reasonable ambition on some levels. The only trouble is, as Betty Friedan pointed out many years ago, one of the first women, um, well, United Nations Women's Conferences, when a bunch of women got up, they were an organisation, Eva will remember them, called the Women Who Want to Be Women. I don't know that anyone was trying to stop them. <laughs> um, fine, you want to be a woman? Go right ahead. Um, you look like one to me. Um, and they just got up and waxed lyrical about being care, you know, looking caregivers and looking after their husbands and reflecting them back at twice their natural size. Um, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Betty Friedan was asked what her opinion of this was. And she said, well, ladies, it's all very well. But you are one breadwinner away from the poverty line. And that is the problem. If you, Dorothy Parker, my absolute hero, put it brilliantly once, she said, ladies, don't put all your eggs in one bastard. <laughs> and I think that advice still holds true today. Um, so that's the problem with the, my sister-in-law and her good one not model is she put all her eggs in one bastard and he turned out to be an absolute bastard and so now she's facing what so many women face, which is an extremely uh, penurious, but also um, 
risky and shaky and insecure old age. And so a lot of the women who are my contemporaries, I'm 56, um, who, who bought the whole line about being a good girl and doing what was asked of them and being nice and all that kind of thing, where they've ended up is on the single pension. That's their reward for doing what the society told them they should do. That's just awful. It's fascinating even about superannuation. This is what happens all the time. A lot of um, feminists do not like the push by uh, some senior corporate women to get more women onto boards. They see that as a kind of uh, white privilege kind of thing. Well, yeah, probably, but actually it remains important. It remains important to have women in all positions of decision-making when there is any decision to be made. Because back in the 80s when superannuation was developed, or 90s, I think it was Paul Keating who did it originally, there were no women at the table. And so superannuation has not worked out well for women because nobody took into account our very different working lives. It still astonishes me how often you have to speak up in a, in a gathering and say, but women's lives simply aren't like that. I remember listening to Mark Latham in 2000. He was waxing lyrical about how I, you know, internet technology was going to liberate our lives and we were all going to be doing things like diagnosing our own diseases. That's turned out well, hasn't it? Um, and I'm afraid I had two small children at that time. I was struggling to do part-time work and I was also doing this particular course that he was speaking at. And I put my hand up and I said, I, I gave him an average day of what I did. I said, I don't want to diagnose my own and my children's diseases. I don't want that responsibility. I've got enough responsibilities in terms of caretaking. It's like the push of the moment which I absolutely loathe, from um, Christopher Pine about autonomous public schools and independent public schools, because we're all going to run them. Because after all, we don't have anything better to do than take over the running of schools. I did, I did, what, 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 what planet? And hospitals, apparently we're going to be running hospitals as well. You know, it's all going to be handed over to the community. Well, the problem with that is, those wealthy communities that can afford to pay people to run their hospitals and their schools will do fine. But those communities that are doing it tough now will just do it even tougher. So all it does, as so often is what happens, is it entrenches the powerful and the privileged with power and privilege and those without, without it. I'm going to stop copying it. I gave my poor sister-in-law when she was having trouble divorcing her bastard husband a book for Christmas and it was entitled Getting in Touch with Your Inner Bitch. <laughs> if only she read it. <laughs> we are still expected to be nice and when we're not nice it's considered terrifying. People kind of like me and they laugh at me, but they're terrified of offering me a job. <laughs> and this is because apparently I'm a massive loose cannon, I could go off in any direction. <laughs> Actually, I just say what I think. And what is terrifying is, turns out, no one will offer me an actual job, but there's a career in saying what you think. I now earn more money than I did when I had an actual bloody job, going around and saying what I think. Who knew it was that easy? What is really scary is that that should be so unusual, you can make a career out of it. That is ridiculous. What are people doing? They're being nice. They're not saying what they think. And the problem is, if you don't say what you think, you won't get ahead. Now, there is a conundrum to that. I recommend the Sheryl Sandberg book, Lean In. Got a lot of flack, but actually I really enjoyed it. And in there, she talks a lot about the nasty cleft stick in which women are caught. 
in our society. You know, you must read all those lovely advice columns that come out in the media all the time about how women should dress differently and speak differently. You should assert yourself more. You should assert yourself less. It's really good to have your kids in childcare. It's really bad to have your kids in childcare. It's really important to, you know, weigh this much. It's no, it's not important at all to weigh that much. You know, it's wonderful. I remember the first time I got exposed to this was when I had a baby and people were telling me, lie it on its side, no lie it on its back, no lie it on its stomach, no lie it on its side, no lie it on its back, no lie it on its stomach. Uh, poor kid. Uh, constantly being told how we could improve. It's the woman as deficit model, never quite good enough, never quite right the way she is. Um, Cheryl Sandberg point, points out that in fact it doesn't matter how much you try to change yourself, it doesn't matter how much weight you try to lose, how much weight you try to put on, uh, it doesn't really matter, nothing actually changes because there's no right way to be a woman in this society. You will always be open to criticism. For example, she you know, uh, cites the fantastic um, experiment that's called the Howard and Heidi experiment. And basically what was done was a series that's been replicated over and over with the same results. So it's really, really robust evidence. Um, they took identical CVs, they gave them to men and women randomly. Um, the, CVs were, the CVs were exactly the same, they just changed the name at the top to Howard or Heidi. And then they asked them to rate the CVs to come back with what they thought of the applicants for these positions. Both Howard and Heidi ranked equally on skills and ability because they were identical CVs. So, okay, that makes sense. However, the higher a respondent, didn't matter whether they were male or female, the higher a respondent ranked Howard on skills and ability, the higher he ranked or she ranked Howard on likability. The exact opposite was true for Heidi. So the more skilled they thought that Heidi was, the less likable they assumed Heidi was. Now this is a really powerful thing and explains why women are so nice. We are so modest. You, you, you go to an award do, hey, I was in advertising, I went to award do's all the time, I even occasionally won some, but then if you're in advertising, Everybody eventually needs something. <laughs> you would see the guys come up to get their award and it was all about them and how fantastic they were and you would see the one or two girls who were allowed that year to get the award because it was embarrassing not to have any. And um, they'd come up and it was always the same thing. Oh, you know, it wasn't me, it was all the other people, they were fantastic, you know, I'm just taking... And I'd do it myself. I do it myself. And people say, see, that's where women fall down. They shouldn't do that. They should stand up for themselves. I'm not going to tell you that. Because the Howard Heidi experiment shows that that doesn't work either. If you do stand up for yourself, well, you're the heinous bitch this spurious psychologist in America was talking about. And if you don't stand up for yourself, you're really nice, but you end up a poor old woman on the single pension. So ladies, it's great. You know, like, oh, I'd really encourage you to be a female. Because it works out so well. You know, either way. Um, but the point about this is to know the truth of this. Because the problem with not understanding how pervasive the biases are against us just because we don't have the magic appendage, um, which apparently equals merit. If you've got one of those, you got merit. Ain't got one of those, uh uh, no merit. Um, just ask Tony Abbott. Um, apparently, he's got a huge one. He's got a lot of merit. Um, so, the problem is that if you don't understand how pervasive the bias is, then when you don't get the chance, or when you do get promoted or get a pay rise, and suddenly you find people being a bit not so keen on you anymore, you take it personally. The reason that feminism is so important for women is it gives us a language and a frame in which we can see the way we're treated and understand that it's not personal. It's not about something we have done. It's about something we are that we cannot change. 
Well, we can change it, but it's expensive and very painful. <laughs> um, so it's probably better not. Uh, I mean, unless you really want to, in which case, whoop, go right there. Um, so the problem with niceness is it's what we're told we should do, but it actually ends up in us in a really awful place. And the problem with niceness is you swallow yourself whole. To be nice, you have to twist yourself into a shape that isn't authentic. Maybe there's some small truth in what that stupid psychologist was saying, not about it being hardwired into us, but that if, if the pressure on us is to be, oh no, I don't mind, no, you, no, that's fine, you take the last cake, I don't mind. No, of course you must have the biggest slice, but oh, no, we don't need to go where I want to go. If we have to do that our whole lives, is it very surprising that occasionally we get really nasty underneath? <laughs> and I'd rather we were nasty up front. <laughs> because it's least as honest and it's least as direct. And also, if you don't ask for what you want, you've got absolutely no chance of getting it. It is important to understand, though, that if you do ask for what you want, you've not got a whole lot of chance of getting it either. <laughs> But at least you face people with the fact that they are denying you what you want. Because when you don't ask for what you want and pretend you don't want it, you're actually making it easy for people not to give you what you want. And that is really self-harm. That is when women self-harm. So it is worth getting out there and allowing yourself to be the person which people go, they're a bit difficult. I think people have said she's a bit difficult. <laughs> Ever since I popped out of the womb, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's me, I don't care. That's what, hey, I'm up here talking to you, it's fun. I get asked, it's great. And I think that also one of the things that I think women get fooled by is this idea that the most important thing in life is to be loved. And so we go around twisting ourselves into all kinds of shapes to make ourselves lovable and attractive and pleasing. We spend a lot of time placating. If I was going to criticise Julia Gillard's Prime Ministership, and I've criticised quite a lot about it, there were things I liked and things I didn't like, uh, but she spent the first two years placating. She placated. It wasn't until that brilliant sexism and misogyny speech where she finally gave that up. And it was such a relief. I think it's one of the reasons women punch the air because she'd stopped trying to get the men to say, oh, well, all right, you can be prime minister. Because they weren't ever going to say it. They weren't ever going to say it. So it's a pity that we feel the need to placate. I'd like us to give that up. If we're going to be in the shit anyway, we may as well honestly be in the shit. <laughs> we may as well point the finger at the people who want to keep us in the shit and say, you know, we're in the shit, you're putting us there, you're putting us there. It's not us. Because love is not the thing any of us should be looking for. Because, I don't know, I've had girlfriends. You know when they were desperate and looking for love and they never found it? And it was the day they went, oh, sod this, I don't care. But they finally met the bloke. So when you look for love, you don't get it. There's something unlovable about looking for love. If we call it being needy, I suppose. What women, I think, want is what men want. Respect. You see, you respect people who say what they really think. You respect people who are themselves, regardless. You respect people who are not perfect, who get things wrong, lose their temper, behave badly, but who, if it's pointed out to them, are able to say, oh, shit, you're right, did do the wrong thing there, sorry about that. But don't fall apart. Don't feel that they've somehow let themselves and the world down. And women are so afraid of doing the wrong thing, of being in the wrong. One of the things I don't like about some forms of feminism is this idea that here's the right way to be a feminist and if you're not that kind of a feminist, well then you're not the right kind of feminist and blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. Feminism is a broad church. I sometimes say it's a broad 
church. <laughs> you can have all kinds of views about feminism. That's what makes it a vigorous, strong, dynamic and robust movement. That there are many different ways of being feminist and we like to argue with one another. Halla bloody Luya. The day we all start singing from the same songbook book, we turn feminism into a cult. Have you seen Hillsong? It's not ready. It's not ready. We don't want to go there. We want to be arguing with one another. We want to be dynamic. We want to be ourselves. That's how you get respect. And the one thing I've learned from Twitter, and it's a really, really important thing to remember, because a lot of women are frightened of Twitter because of the trolls. I have to tell you, the trolls are pathetic. They really, really, really are. You don't need to be frightened of them. A, you can block them. B, you've got a fair few followers. You can retweet them and watch your followers pile on, and that's, that's a really sweet experience. <laughs> it's exactly the same feeling as, you know, when you were about to be bullied by someone behind the shelter shed, and then just as they're about to hit you or say something mean to you, all your friends came around the corner and bashed them up. It's that feeling. It's really good. It's really good. I recommend that. Um, but the thing about trolls is the more effect feminism, women's voices, women being direct, refusing to be nice, refusing to placate, putting their case over and over and over and over and over and using logic and using reason and humour and wit and irony and yes, being in the speeches when the occasion demands, the more you do that, the nastier the insults in return. Excellent! The more you worry them, the nastier they are. If only we use that as a measure of our success. Because it is. When they're nice to you and they say, oh, that nice little feminism, yes, it's a lovely little movement, you know we're dead. <laughs> you know we're over. You know they've killed us. Feminism is not meant to be nice. It wants to take half the power. Nobody has ever given power away willingly. You have to take it. It has to be fought for. That is quintessentially not nice. So ladies, I'd like to recommend to you all today, when you leave here, you go out and you do something deliberately not nice. <laughs> I hate those kind gestures, things, you know, where you pay the toll for the person behind you. Oh, get a lot. Um, do something deliberately not nice. You will feel so much better for it. There is something so delightful about being naughty, transgressive, and yes, nasty. Um, and hey, if you stand up for yourself, they're going to call you nasty anyway. So you may as well do it deliberately, it's my, my message to you. So, um, good luck with that. <laughs> I look forward to seeing the results of all that heinous bitchery um, overflowing into this community. Um, just to see a few people, powerful people in particular, feeling a little more miserable than they usually do, will be satisfaction and reward enough. Thank you so much for inviting me to your birthday.